suppose one of the problems when you're one of the last ones, most people have actually talked about what you're going to talk about. So there's going to be a little bit of repetition throughout this, I think. Um, also, I think one of the things that I didn't see much of the, like the last two days was about the counter development plan and the importance of the counter development plan. I know Liam doesn't want to talk about planning, so I'll keep it very short. I just added it to the official presentation, just to kind of pick up on it as well. Um, and I think the, I suppose, you know, if we want to halt biodiversity loss by 2030, we will need to take some seriously drastic action. And that includes local authorities as well. And I suppose the county development plan is, the, is, I suppose, the place where you can set out your stall or what it is that you want to achieve and how you're going to do it and include objectives then in the county development plan that you can follow up on. Because, uh, and what it also does, particularly during the consultation process for a county development plan, you can actually see what the public and what your councillors are going to make of those actions. Now, most will probably ignore what is there, and that's okay too. But I suppose when it comes to it, when you actually want to do a project, you can always say to people, well, there's an objective in the Council Development Plan to do this, so therefore, we're actually we're going to do this project, basically. Now, this is just a green infrastructure network for Fingal. This is a brief summary now, because like you have heard plenty about green infrastructure already. Uh, but I would encourage every local authority to develop a network like this, because it basically becomes your main framework for uh, well, nature conservation, the deli delivery of nature conservation actions, but also climate action, flood control, uh, natural immunity development. It actually does a lot of things at the same time. Now, just to, like, it's a bit hard to see in this, but if you kind of look at it from, uh, from this perspective, the areas in blue, they are, are designated sites, so they are more important sites that we have, but mainly estuaries in our case. There is yellow areas around that. Um, again, these are areas uh, where, um, where the migratory birds go when I suppose it's high tide. So if you want to protect the, uh, your designated sites, which is in this case the special protection areas for the migratory birds, you also have to protect the lands that sit around it. And this is effectively a non-statutory designation that we have basically created this way. The areas in green are nature development areas, and these are sort of land uses in which we feel there's great scope for combining it with nature conservation. So in this case, think quarries, think domains, think uh, golf courses, uh, certain areas of high value farmland. So the idea that what we want to do there is to work with landowners to improve these areas for, for wildlife while also maintaining the existing function. And then the light blue line sort of in between, there are the corridors. And the idea with that is to connect all these areas. So if a population disappears in one place, it actually can be repopulated by the same species from somewhere else. This is just really the thing in a nutshell, right? Um, but one thing is put on paper, you also have to sell the vision. So what we have done, I suppose, we got one of the Dutch artists to come up with some sort of vision statement, I suppose, ultimately where we want to go. And if you kind of look at it up close, you can kind of see sort of, is there a pointer on this? Yeah. So we're, we're looking at sort of like nature-friendly nature, nature -friendly farming. We're looking at restoring our rivers with lamprey and salmon and dippers. Uh, we're looking at rewilding projects. We're looking at woodland uh, restoration projects. We're looking at large-scale uh, rewetting projects. The whole idea, I suppose, it kind of provides us with a bit of an idea where we can go back to the community with. We want, this is basically where we want to go. And the whole idea, I suppose, where if we, and I think something we have not been really good at, is when you, as with nature conservation in general in Ireland, we're very good to say what we don't want. But we never really say what we do want. And I think that's why it's important, even at national level, and I ultimately hope that the National Biodiversity Plan will also do a bit of work on that, instead of a tree-line statement that you have to sell to the community. It will have to be a lot better than that, because it's the only way, I suppose, to kind of get people's attention. Now, how does that translate on site? This is just to give you one example. Uh, this is an area between Port Marnock and Baldoyle, and there's basically like a, one of the buffer zones is located next to Baldoyle Bay. So this is an important area for, uh, for migratory birds. These red dots here also means there's legal, or like, uh, legally protected species in that, and uh, the river runs through it. And so we know it's an important place for wildlife, yet at the same time, what we're also gonna do uh, is this is Port Marnock and that's Baldoyle, and there's gonna be another 12,000 people living here over the next 10 years. So that's going to be huge pressure on the, on the designated site. So I suppose the way we want to deal with that is by developing the whole buffer zone as one long, I suppose one big regional park, it's around 220 acres. Um, but in the local area plan for each area, we've already set aside areas for nature conservation. You can see for the migratory birds, and this is for arable birds, and more for the migratory birds there as well. And similarly on the bald oil end, we have set aside quite a large area already as well for nature conservation specifically. Not any other uses, nature conservation only. And not because we have to, but because we want to. And 
ultimately then you, you go to the, uh, the, from, the, from the local air plan and to the actual master plan for the park. Now, don't worry too much about the detail. But what we did here, we actually asked the local community, what is it that you want to see and do in the park? We didn't draw anything. We didn't come with a project already. It's like, no, we know we have to develop a master plan here, but it also has to be a park for you and what you want. We also asked the nature conservation agencies what they wanted, but the local area plan already provided us with a basis that you have to provide for nature conservation in this master plan. The interesting thing in terms of feedback that we got, because I suppose there's an area here sort of in the center that has been left untouched really for the last 20 years after farming stopped, and the local people call it the wilderness. Now to me it's just a bit of scrubland, but for the locals this was the place they actually want to keep that way. And for me that's absolutely perfect, because there is a lot of nature conservation value in it, and I suppose we kind of like we, we basically provide something what the local community wants anyway. They didn't ask for playgrounds here, they didn't ask for like soccer pitches, they wanted to keep this. So it made our job an awful lot easier when actually developing the master plan for the park to actually cater for these things because the local community was asking for it in the first place. Now the next step then, I suppose, once you make your plans, you can implement them. Um, and again, this is just to kind of give you an example for the areas for the geese, and just a close-up shot in case you couldn't see the black little black yolks in the in the first picture. Um, but also restoration of Breckers grasslands. They, like there was a flood defense scheme done here in 2000 that cut off the Breckers water supply. So what we have done now basically is reinstated that. And you can see like it's actually re-wetting really well. We have combined that with grazing with highland cows um, because the, the boar salt marsh grass needs a little bit of light poaching on the Breckers condition in order to get it back. But what it also does, most people are scared shitless of these cows, <laughs> right? And it basically means that those areas where we have them, people tend to stay out of them. And there's less disturbance, and it's actually better for crown nesting birds, right? So there's, there's reason to the madness. Um, but the other thing then uh, is monitoring. So in this case, this is Skylark breeding site. We have been actually monitoring this park since 2013. Um, it's not a fully up-to-date map. But it allows us also then to see, like, what the measures that you take, is it working or not? What are the impacts of it? There's, like, there should be a 2019 as well. So you can kind of see where they started off, they're still there. So despite us both developing this park and adding new walkways and new facilities, the birds are all still there. And that's really one of the main things we wanted to find out, so we have no negative impact on it. So I suppose what I'm trying to say with that is that you started with your county development plan as an objective, which translates into a local area plan, which translates into a park development plan, which ultimately translates on work on the site for nature conservation. And that's why it's kind of important to start at the beginning. Now, regional parks, again, this was more the climate change side of things in terms of wetland creation. Um, this is just to kind of make the point that wetlands, particularly big regional parks, they're great places to kind of cater for new wetland development and climate change action, whether it's, I suppose, in this case, this is actually holding a lot, um, holding a lot of the flood water back and it kind of helps therefore to kind of flu uh, avoid flood, uh, flooding problems further downstream. Similarly, we're actually removing flood embankments along the estuaries in order to kind of restore uh, salt marsh along it. Again, like, so public open spaces do provide opportunities both for nature conservation as well as climate actions. And again, I think Bernie kind of touched on that quite a bit already this, this morning as well. Now, the real topic of my presentation was indeed about sort of residential open space and in terms of design and management. And just a... I suppose this is just, I'm mainly focusing on residential open space because theoretically it could be any open space, whether it's to do with industrial open space or uh, commercial open space. This is more residential because that's where most of the people are. Uh, now, I suppose it's just uh, a typical thing. For us, it's a lot of tillage land that we're converting into a housing estate. So you go from a farmland habitat to an urban habitat with mown grass and not so great looking hedgerow, but a lot of urban development right next to it. That also means your species that you're dealing with are going to change. If you start off with farmland, typical farmland species, and what you're ultimately left with is a lot of more generic species. And it kind of, again, it comes back, why is that important, you might wonder, but it ultimately comes down, what are your target species for urban development? Um, I suppose uh, Kitty, uh, Kitty like, uh, referred to it yesterday, in terms of the target species, the 30 target species for the urban environment. We have to do something fairly similar. If you're starting off with these because they're there, I mean, good luck holding on to them. You can try if it's still, if the if development's right next to farmland, you still might be able to hold on to some of that. In our older estates, all the habitat they need is long gone. You're not going to get it back. So again, the selection of target species is quite important that way. And also what Kitty was saying in terms of the lifestyle needs, you know, you need your nesting for house sparrow, but you also need the hedgerows, uh, like where they find the cover. You need somewhere where they can drink and bathe, and this, there's a, a sand bath as well. 
you need the insect for their chicks, and they actually eat seed themselves. So if you want to provide for house sparrow, all these things have to be provided in your open space, right? Um, now, this is sort of standard open space, you know, nice mown grass, lollipop trees over here. Um, this is what people are used to. And sometimes it's actually really good, because the brand geese, for example, they love this sort of stuff. And they say, because we have the ash trees, we do, we do have to take into account that we have to, come, well, because again, Ricky um, mentioned this yesterday as well, you know, we have to make sure that we're not making changes to open spaces that are important for brand geese. And in our case, we actually have done a lot of GPS tracking where all the geese go. So like a lot of these are sort of open spaces they sit underneath them. So we know exactly at this stage where all those open spaces are for the geese. And that helps us then to kind of focus on those, and, and I suppose the parks that are in there, that we keep them as short grass, and then we just focus on some of the others uh, where, the problem, where we couldn't cause problems for the brand geese, basically. But it's going back to this. You know, like this is what you're looking at now, and this is what it could look like. Now, I just, I just as a general question, who would like to have this on their doorstep? If when you look out your window, right, of your house, you like it. Okay, well, there's not quite half. I'd say a third, right? I wish you all lived in Fingal. <laughs> we don't have that many takers for it. This is what happens when you start rewilding open space. This picture was taken in Nap. It gives you an idea. Ten years later, after it was a meadow, this is what it's going to look like. So rewilding open space ten years later, this is your result. And most people here don't want to see it on their doorstep, right? And this is one of the first problems. Because it basically means we want something actually else. We're conditioned for something very different. Similarly, I, I've asked my boss now a couple of times, why don't we just plant woodland? Uh, I think it was, uh, was it Christine this morning said, like, we have, to, we, we have to cut our open space at least 13 times a year. If you plant woodland, you're done. But again, people don't want woodland in their open space either. Because where are my kids going to play? And that's an often question we often get. Now, when I was a kid, this is where I used to play. We, had no, we didn't have the pitches at the time, so this was normal. But nowadays, this is not anymore. This is not normal any longer. Nowadays, what we want a lot of is meadows. And we want loads of color. And so, like, so we're going to change our open space, and we're going to get more meadow that way. So this is just to kind of give you an idea, I suppose, of all the opportunities that are there, right? So in terms of, yes, you can create meadow areas. Uh, again, not by sowing the mixes, but just allowing sort of the grass to grow and see what comes up. And after, after a number of years, if nothing happens, then you can collect local seed and actually plant those into it. In this case, this is Marion and Scaries, who has been collecting the seeds and everything, and we can plant them into our open spaces. Because, again, what is the likelihood that a lot of those people, a lot of these plants will ultimately settle or come back into an urban area if they were tillage land and we're creating a grass and habitat? So I'm not, I know, I'm not quite a plant Nazi that way, that I think you can actually just try to increase it that way. Uh, another option as well is in terms of phase mowing. Uh, again, what we have started, what I suppose, and I suppose, uh, partly in response to the pollinator plant, where everybody says, okay, you cut and lift. But you have to ask yourself, do you need to lift everything? Um, because, so phase mowing in this case allows, is, is sort of cutting an entire area over a three year cycle. So the first year you cut certain areas, the second year you kind of cut another area, and then the third year you cut another. And the idea is that, that you don't cut the same place every, uh, every year. The whole idea behind it is that things like butterflies, for example, a lot of the caterpillars are dependent on the long grass. A lot of insects, the spiders, beetles, are also dependent on the long grass. We mow all the grass out of it, and we cut and collect it, and we, yes, we cater for floristic diversity, but your insect diversity flies down. Um, so again, it's better, to, and what it also does, I suppose, it reduces the overall amount of grass you generate if you have to get rid of it. So therefore, it's also actually cheaper. So maybe less cutting in one area is actually better than trying to collect all of it. Water, really important. Fran uh, did a great presentation on it already yesterday. This is indeed one of the suds ponds. Uh, this was actually one of our first ones. Um, again, really important in terms of bird life, you know, whether it's for drinking and watering, even for the house barns to collect their mud on it. Uh, you have the, uh, like the bats like, feeding there, amphibians. I see Rob here as well, so I have to mention the amphibians. Um, that's all very important as well. And again, it, they, there's great opportunities here where the sod systems, you have to design them right. And that's really going to be the main thing, that you, again, you know what you're actually designing it for. And then trees, hedgerows, and scrub. Again, you know, ideally you want, sort of like, uh, again, where you come from a pollinator perspective or a bird's perspective or a mammal perspective, you kind of want to keep the hedgerows that you have now. 
and kind of maintain those properly, but also to allow for more diverse planting if it's not there. So, you, you know, where you got your blackthorn, your hawthorn, your gelder rose, your dog rose, to kind of provide you with a range of flowering shrubs, basically, like throughout the year, but also have the berries then at the end of it then for the bird life later on. So trying to have a, have a wide range of species, basically, to kind of increase the overall diversity that is there. Five minutes, that's okay. You, are you still going to do your dance? Yeah. He said he was going to dance like over 20 minutes. I'm very tempted. Um, the, other thing, the other thing as well is in terms of deadwood. Um, again, like very important habitat in terms of cover, things like hedgehogs and the likes of that. Similarly, fungi, uh, beetles, bees, can all avail of these things as well. Um, and then if you want to go still do something more slightly with more intervention, uh, sacrificial crops, this is usually what we only use in nature reserves. This is sort of like a big bird feeding table. It's a mixture of uh, cereals and wildflowers. The idea then during the year provides for the insects and then in uh, winter time it provides a big, all, all the seed that's in it basically is for, the, for a lot of the seed eating birds. Again, you can include those as well. So there's loads of different things that you can do to enhance your open spaces. But also, if you kind of look at it, well, what can people do themselves then? You know, we have your open space in the state, but why do people not plant more perennials that are pollinator friendly? Um, but they also provide nesting facilities, green walls, green roofs. Like, all these things can be done. You can actually design an entire housing estate with all these things. But most of it is not compulsory. You're not obliged as a developer to actually build green roofs. Same with green walls, frame with sods, none of it is compulsory, so most of the time it all gets designed out of it because it's considered too expensive, too awkward, and we don't know enough about it. So I was meant to go on the challenges, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll move on now. So the challenges, and, and so I suppose this is something that we have now discovered a good many times. What people expect and what you get is something very different. Wildflower meadows are the most notorious for that. This is what people see on the packages. So when we say we want to create a wildflower meadow in your, in your estate, oh yes, please, and this is what they get. And that's when the complaints start coming, right? So there's a big difference, there's a lot of education to be done around that. And like the fact that like this is all annuals, this is not a wildflower meadow, but this is the concept that people have been sold. And every time when we do this, every time this problem arises as a result of that. I'm just looking at the time here. People can be a major problem as well. We design regional parks a certain way, you know, and 80% of the people will stick to the pathways and the likes of that. There's always some that think it's perfectly fine to have your dogs chasing the swans around to see if they can catch them. You know, I did not design for that. But unfortunately, you have to sort of adjust for that mentality that there's always people that will do stuff that you couldn't think of when you actually designed in the first place. Um, this is another people problem. This is the nice version of it, right? Um, a lot of the times we get asked to remove shrubbery over and over again because the teenagers are drinking in there. Now, this is a bigger social issue with alcohol in Ireland, but we, we won't be able to solve that. But again, you want scrubs and hedgerows? Forget it, because every time we rip them out. And this is happening over and over again. It starts off, you start with a beautiful old hedgerow, then the next thing, like there's problems with the teenagers as the estate matures a little bit, then we start ripping out, the, the, we're gonna limb up the trees so you can look into it so the teenagers can't hide in it. Then people start dumping their garden waste in the actual ditch itself, and then it becomes an utter mess, and eventually then, oh well, let's just take the whole thing out because it looks awful. And that's how we're losing a lot of hedgerows. You have your retained during the planning process, and then people start looking at it in a way, so they're like, well, it's very hard to maintain this. Nettles and brambles, another one. Like at one of the council meetings recently, I was asked to see if we could eliminate nettles from our open space. <laughs> I kid you not, this is a real thing. And the problem with it again is, you know, we design out risk in our open space. There's no risk. You can't have nettles, you can't have brambles, you can't have anything that might injure the child. Like my first reaction was, well, the kids will do it once and then it won't do it again. <laughs> but that's not the way we look at things anymore. It's a similarly as well, I suppose, because safety, I suppose, is important. And I suppose the whole idea, I suppose, like with big old trees, yes, you have to keep an eye on them and you do need regular inspections. Water, always considered, oh, no, no, big no-no in housing estates. Now, I'm rich from the Netherlands. We were surrounded by water as kids. I don't see this as a major restriction whatsoever. But again, it all comes down to design. When you do the design where you have nice shallow banks, basically, kids can even play in the water. This is actually a SUDS feature, which is a playground with water. So it can be done. We don't do them here. 
This is, a, this is an example from Germany in this case. But it can easily be done. It all comes down to good design. Again, like initially, I know from uh, tours in, in the UK where they put railings along it. And then if, if something happened to the kid, the parents could actually could, like the kid was able to get through the railing. The parents couldn't get over the railing. You know, simple things like this, it makes a difference. Now, finally then, I have, okay, I'm almost done. No, I'll fly to this then. Grass meadows, because it was, uh, Christine mentioned this already as well. A uh, big problem for us is the meadow, uh, meadow management uh, in terms of if you flail it, like you lose your diversity. We have, for the big regional parks, we have uh, farmers bailing it. In our urban areas, we can't get anybody to collect it. And this is a big problem for us, so we're kind of looking at new machinery. You can kind of, you know, you could do zero grazers, you can have flails with collector units behind them, but the bigger problem ultimately is, what do you do with all this stuff? Now, Christine was saying, like, you know, if it's a small amount, you can kind of put it on site, or, like, you know, if it, you can bring it to a recycling center. In our case, we have to dispose of it, and it's around 1,000 euro an acre. Now, if you, we have several hundred acres of open space, and you multiply by 1,000 on an annual bill. My boss wouldn't like to see me coming with that sort of uh, with that approach. And this is a big problem for us at the moment. You know, when you kind of look at pro processing this amount of grass that we have, you're looking at biogas installations. The composting units don't want to see us coming either because it's too much material at the same time of the same, uh, same material, so it doesn't work. And then briquettes was another one that's kind of being, being looked at as well. We haven't solved this problem yet, and that's why actually in our case, a lot of the, uh, the urban meadows or in the housing estates haven't progressed at all. This is one of the solutions we are looking at, sheep grazing them, to basically bring, a, bring the sheep, a herd of sheep into a housing estate, let them graze it out and then bring them out again. Looks ridiculous, this is an example from the Netherlands, but I've seen this in Belgium, Holland and Germany done as well. My providers with an alternative. We do have an, our own farm as well, so we could actually do this. <coughs> um, so I suppose for us then, this is the last slide name, um, in relation to what we're planning to do now, so my colleague Debbie, she's working on the implementation of 23 Tidy Towns Biodiversity Plans, we're also going to be, so where we, we'll be doing a lot of these things, we're also going to do three demonstration projects in housing estates to work with the local community to determine exactly what, the, what they would like to do for biodiversity. As we will run it as a competition initially, but the whole idea that we want to see, well, what are people okay with? You can do a Rolls-Royce design to a Lada design in terms of enhancing your open space, and then the idea is that we can see what people are, what they want to do, but also the important thing here is to find out, we do the monitoring. We start, we, we kind of look what birds, bats, insects and everything are there before you start, and then as the years go by, you see what comes back, because I'm still not convinced what the actual most cost economical way is of um, improving biodiversity in urban areas. And we would spend a lot of money on it, but we have no idea what the effect on this actually might be. So uh, that's just something. And then the last thing, this was just a comment we got on our biodiversity plan. You know, you know that there is a crisis, now act like there is one. And I, I have to say, this is just something that always resonates with me, because in fairness, I think for what I'm seeing, it doesn't seem to be the case. Business is normal, you know, and um, we have to start acting like there is a crisis and all of this stuff as you speed it up. It's great to see another 10 biodiversity officers being appointed. And then, and now I'll let you go then. Yeah, okay, because he, gets, he looks very angry at me now. Right. <laughs>